welcome you all in Jesus' name. As every Sunday is a special day, opportunity for us to hear God's Word, to be fed by God's Word, and prepare them for service in His kingdom. Today we have another special event along with our worship, and that's uh, baptism today. Clementine gets baptized today, and uh, we're excited about that. Kind of interesting how uh, God does things that, that we don't plan for. As we've been going through the catechism, I think it's it's his plan that we would have the third article of the creed together with the baptism today. And I think I think you'll understand that more clearly as the worship service goes on. But you're probably already grasping it now. I, I trust you are. There are a lot of announcements today, so I'll try to get through them rapidly. Uh, first, remind the uh, youth, you have your meeting at 6.30 and then the adults prayer here at church at, at 7 o'clock. So uh, we encourage people to come. Prayer is leaving all the things that we worry about in God's hands and uh, so grateful that we can leave them in hands that can do things way beyond what we can do. So we want God's work done here, not just human work. So I encourage you to come on Wednesday at uh, 7 o'clock. The uh, WMF District Rally is finally at hand. It will be in Mula this coming Saturday. It begins at 10 o'clock in the morning, and they are now on Central Time. I think it's about a three-hour drive down there. So are you meeting at the church at 7 o'clock? Gene, you're probably going around the... By the way, meet at church at 7 to take off for Mula this coming Saturday. So uh, some of you ladies weren't getting used to getting up early in the morning. Um, practice all week long so that you can be up at 7 o'clock Saturday. Uh, be a great event to hear how God is at work through missionaries in Brazil. Um, we're taking a special offering next Sunday. And it will be for our Mondack and a family Bible camp. Kind of interesting. I've got one more announcement that kind of attaches to that. As you go out today, Tara has envelopes and only enough for one per family. You know what? There used to be a, a foam thing on this. And if it's going to pop like that all the time, at least it'll keep Bill awake. Okay, it's going to be there. Um, I guess I can take it off here and put it on there. Anyway, uh, be sure you grab one of these. Uh, family camp is going well. We want to make sure that we don't have to raise the prices and, and maybe price some people out of going to family camp. It's a growing camp right now. God has been at work. Uh, the dates for camp are in the bulletin. This is coming June 22, or excuse me, July 22 through 26. If you show up in June, there won't be a lot of our people there. Anyway. Maybe another camp will be going on. Uh, camp Carmel and uh, wonderful time to grow in uh, grace and holiness, uh, to hear God's word, to fellowship together with other Christians throughout the district. And if you like the state fair, there's a bonus. State fair is going on at the same time. Uh, the camp is only 20 miles east of Minot. So afternoons are free. If that's what you want to do for recreation, let's go to the state fair and sweat to death. That's what happened to me last time I was there. You're welcome to do that. So um, I want to encourage people to, to come to camp this year, but also support it so that everyone's able to go. Get an envelope next week if you just put your donation in toward the camp. Make it out to Mondack. And, uh, it's in the bulletin. It's also on the envelope. Mondack at the camp. It means Montana, Dakota, Canada. We haven't had anybody from Canada for a while now, but hopefully they'll be back again. We've got people from Montana and, and uh, North Dakota. It'll, it'll make sure, it'll help make sure that anybody who wants to go can go. Vacation Bible School, again, we remind you, is the 11th through the 15th of June. It's the same week as annual conference down in Dickinson. Uh, some I know will be down there, but uh, we'll be praying for Vacation Bible School, and I want to encourage you to be inviting neighbors and so on and so forth today to, uh, to Vacation Bible School. Also, one more announcement that isn't in the bulletin because uh, it came just in the last few days. Um, a guy named Wade Mobley. Anybody here know that name? Okay, Wade Mobley happens to be the president of our schools, Bible school and seminary. Uh, they're organized in such a way right now that there's a president over both schools and then a dean of the seminary and a dean of the Bible school. Uh, Wade is the president over the schools. Here's the interesting thing. His wife's name was Michelle Dubner. And I got to know Michelle from the time she was a tiny little girl at Bible camp back in the old days. 
So I've been here 30 years, and I don't know, she's 30 some odd, maybe 40 some years old, I'm not sure. Any, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Once they get over 40, it's 29 years now. Right? Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know if Michelle will be here, but Wade is coming next week, and uh, he gave me a message saying, hey, if you want me to preach, uh, I, I'm willing to do it. He's going to bring us an update on our schools, but I said, yeah, go for it. And I told him Beaver Creek was in the evening, so maybe he wanted to do just manual. He says, no, I'll be glad to do both. So next week, uh, Wade Mobley, the president of AFLTS, Association Free Lutheran Theological Seminary, and AFLBS, Association Free Lutheran Bible School, uh, will be bringing the message from God's Word and also sharing with us uh, how God has been at work in both of those schools. Um, it's a ministry we support. Uh, our offering goes to the AFLC, uh, what is it, 12% rate soon? Goes to the AFLC and they divide it. Pardon? 15% of our offering every week goes to AFLC. And the schools is one of the three major departments to which it goes, and, and we've given special offerings, I know, as well, to the schools. So it's, it's good to get feedback then as to what God is doing as, as we pray for that work and as we support it with our uh, with finances that God has provided through us. And I think that's all the announcements. Am I forgetting anything? No, I'm forgetting something. Yes, Rob. Well, we have the cleaning closet with a bunch of uh, paper vacuum cleaner bags on the chairs and the entryway. Uh, if you have a vacuum cleaner that uses any of those, take them. Okay. Otherwise, they go to the garbage or Look at that and clean your bags, and if, if they fit one of your baggage, grab them. They're yours. Thank you all for doing that, too, by the way. And Nancy seems to have something, too. If anybody wants a picture taken of their family right after church, we have to Okay. If you need a picture taken for the directory, I take it then. Uh, we could try to do it right after church today. Uh, talk to Nancy. Okay. Anything else? We will read together then God's Word, Colossians 3, 1 through 4, our call of worship. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for continuing to love us even after we have rebelled against you. Thank you that salvation is by grace through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that you give the gift of Jesus and the gift of faith in him to those who are undeserving through your word and spirit. As your word comes to us both in, as it's proclaimed and as it comes to us through baptism in the Lord's Supper. Thank you for the opportunity we have today to witness the fact that you give the gift of faith even to those who can't understand the contents of their faith yet. And those who grow to such a state that they can't understand it any longer, we can rest in your grace that you sustain that faith. So Lord, bless us with your word today that we might find our trust resting not in ourselves at all, but fully and completely in you, in your grace, and in your, in your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to begin today as our focus on the third article of the Creed looks at the Holy Spirit and sanctification with a, a hymn that is also a prayer. And a prayer that, that God through the Holy Spirit would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts. Uh, number 124, let's stand while we sing this prayer together. Open my eyes that I may see.
couple passages from Scripture today that I think help us understand as, as we confess our faith. In the third article of the Creed, the, the article that speaks of the Holy Spirit and His work in our lives and in the church, uh, Scripture passages that help us understand how Luther came to write the explanation he wrote in his small catechism. He did not write his explanations based on his own ideas or his own imagination. He based his meanings to the articles of the Creed based on his study of Scripture, and I trust we'll see that clearly today. So our first lesson is from Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10 should sound familiar as we've been using that for our memory passage through Lent. We're going to read uh, the first 10 verses then in their entirety where Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, records God's word, which says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings, of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great mercy, because of his great love for us, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. God raised us up with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is a gift, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one may boast, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're going to read also Peter's testimony concerning who Jesus is, but paying special attention to where this understanding of who Jesus is came from. Jesus makes clear that it didn't come from Peter. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon the son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone at least at that time, that he was the Christ. We will... Yeah, that's the end of the scripture. Abiding steadfast, firm and sure, the statutes of our God endure. Blessed he who trusts his steadfast, is forming the church. We will uh, read together then the words of the third article of the Creed as they're recorded in italics in our bulletin. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And uh, Luther in his small catechism asks the question, what does this mean? We'll read together his answer as he gets this from studying God's word 
and, and then writes what we're confessing then explains it more thoroughly. We'll read together. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and preserved me in the true faith. In like manner, as he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and preserves it in union with Jesus Christ in the one true faith, in which Christian church he daily forgives abundantly of all my sins and the sins of all believers, and at the last day will raise up me from all the dead, and grant everlasting life to me and to all who believe in Christ. This is most certainly true. Grant, Heavenly Father, that through understanding what your word teaches us concerning what you have done for us, we might be set free from our pride that wants to boast of anything that has to do with restoring our relationship with you. And also, Heavenly Father, that we might be set free from despair that sets into us when, when we look anywhere else for a cause of our salvation. I pray that you'd help us understand that, that we might have absolute peace and know that it comes from you and from your Holy Spirit and from your gospel, and, and from that alone, that we might look nowhere else but to you. As we struggle living in this world, do your work in us, Heavenly Father, and, and teach us so that we might be able to assure those who are struggling with doubt, and that we might be able to call those who are prideful about their salvation to repentance and true faith in Jesus. Grant this, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, sanctification, that word is a fancy word, it means literally being set apart. A lot of times we use the narrow sense of that term, it speaks of us changing, uh, being set apart by God, and the fact that as Christians we do grow, and, and in the narrow sense sanctification is, is used to talk about our Christian growth. The fact that as we come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord, and, and are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, that the fruit of the Spirit grows in our lives, and we know what that is. The Bible tells us it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the opposite of everything I am by nature. And sometimes my nature comes out. I think I've told you a lot of times it comes out while I'm on the road. And then I found out that a lot of the people have purpose to be angry at me when I'm on the road too as I'm growing older and I'm making more mistakes. Please don't take my license away yet. I, I don't think <laughs> God's Word tells us something that maybe we find shocking in Ephesians chapter 2. It talks about our condition, and it's kind of interesting that Paul begins uh, speaking of the, the people at Ephesus as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. This is Paul talking about them, but not himself. The answer to that is no. As, as this passage goes on, he also includes himself when, when he says that all of us also uh, lived among them, those who are dead, those who are following their own lust. He explains exactly what that is, that spiritual death is. Uh, it's following our own ways in this world. We used to live following the ways of this world, the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. But by nature, objects of wrath, then, Paul says, that we were following our own desires and our own thoughts that are contrary to God's desires and thoughts. We've been talking about allowing our, our thoughts to be our guide. Luther saw that uh, reason is a gift from God in the first article of the Creed. He says that reason is one of the things God has given us. He's given us our eyes and ears, our reason, and all the powers of our soul, and we're to be thankful for that gift. But Luther saw clearly, and rightly so, that because we're spiritually dead, many people allow their reason to become the ultimate source of authority, the ultimate source of deciding what's true and false. And it becomes quite apparent that those who allow reason to be the final source of authority, to the final word, as to what's true and what's false are always led into what's false. And what's destructive then for themselves and for those that are around them, and if they have influence on others, what they proclaim as being true is, is always detrimental. 
Don't trust those who trust in their own intellect first and foremost for truth. It's not a good fundamental source of truth. It's a great gift by which we can discover some truths, but we better have a foundation for what's true before we begin using our intellect and, and analyzing the things of this world. Worse today, people are called on to follow their emotions. If you think intellect is a poor guide, emotions are far worse. That's what spiritual death is. We want to put something in the place of God. God should be the one who reveals truth to us and whose truth we follow. God is a good guy. We know all kinds of verses. There's a way that seems right to man, but the end there was a way of death. Trust in the Lord, as, as we used to hear all the time from Job. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Well, spiritual death is trusting something other than the Word of God, other than God and what He tells us. To find life, to find meaning, to find purpose, to find value, to find guidance. Whatever we're looking for, if we're trusting in, any, in anything above God's word, we're trusting the wrong thing. And that's what spiritual death is. By nature, we run away from God. By nature, we trust in our emotions to guide us. Horrible guide. Our emotions don't tell us what's true very well at all. Sometimes they correspond to truth. Sometimes we're depressed when the circumstances around us are depressing. Sometimes we're depressed when everything's going well and we can't figure out why and we can't change it. There, there's a truth that exists and our emotions are not a reliable source to tell us what those truths are and yet our world to date is asked from people all the time, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? Your answer should be, well, what I feel doesn't really matter near as much as what is true. We are dead spiritually. And, and that means that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. Last week we looked at the second article of the Creed where we considered who Jesus is, the Son of God and the Son of Man. We, we considered what he did. He came to to buy us, to purchase us, to redeem us, lost and condemned creatures, to buy us and free us from all sin, death, and the power of the devil. That, that's what we're owned by. We're owned by death, we're owned by sin, we're owned by the power of the devil. We turn away from God by nature, and we can't turn toward him. We don't want to. We have no desire to do that whatsoever. Indeed, God is a threat to us because we know we're sinners. If we allow our feelings or our own intellect to be our primary guide. And therefore, most people who take the intellectual side try to explain God away. And, and those who take the feeling side find all kinds of excuses to not follow God. They simply are driven by fear. That's our condition. We're spiritually dead. We're not spiritually sick. We're not spiritually wounded. We are spiritually dead. What can a dead person do? Nothing. A dead person can do nothing. We see physical death, it, it helps us understand what spiritual death is like. There's a guy named Lazarus. We've looked at him before. We've considered him before. He died. He was in the grave for four days. And, and Jesus showed up and he said, take the stone away. People said, ah, Jesus, not a good idea. He's going to stink by now. Not a good idea. Jesus said, do it anyway. And he did something very strange. He talked to a dead man. As a matter of fact, he gave a command to a dead man. And the amazing thing is, when he gave a command to a dead man, that dead man was no longer dead. He said, Lazarus, come out. And he did. Could Lazarus do that? Could Lazarus respond to Jesus' words? No, he was dead. What gave him the power to respond to Jesus' words? And the answer is, Jesus' words. Jesus gave him the power. Lazarus could do nothing. Jesus did it all. And he was brought from death to life. We need to realize our condition, if spiritually speaking, is dead. We will never come to God. We'll never come to trust in Jesus by our own reason or our own strength. This is important for us to know for two reasons. Kind of opposite reasons. Number one is 
there are many people who think they've done something for their salvation and they become very proud. I'm better than others. I made a better decision than so and so. We both heard the same message. And look at they, they responded the wrong way, but I, I responded the right way. Look at me. Look at what I did. They should be like me. Look how wonderful I am. And, and the other response can be, okay, I responded, but man, I, I find myself continuing to do things that I know I shouldn't do. I find myself continuing to think things I know I shouldn't think. Can I really be a Christian? Was I, was I really sincere when I made that decision to trust in Jesus? Uh, maybe, maybe I didn't do it right. Maybe I didn't say it the right way. Maybe I wasn't sincere enough. Maybe I wasn't dedicated enough. Maybe I was only committed, like I heard one preacher say, and not sold out. Let's try this. Does that fit? It doesn't fit. Not sold out. And, and we keep looking at ourselves for an answer. That is the wrong place to look. A dead person can't do anything for themselves. They can't fix the problem. And Scripture teaches us to understand that that's our condition spiritually by birth. Being related to Adam, we're born spiritually dead. And I know that sounds like terrible news, but it's actually good news. Because it teaches us then when we look to be saved that we quit looking at ourselves altogether. There is no hope here. That doesn't mean there's no hope. There was no hope for Lazarus. That didn't mean at least in Lazarus. It doesn't mean there was no hope, period. The hope was in Jesus and his word. And so the first part of what Luther explains is that I can't by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ to come to him, believe, meaning not only to intellectually believe that he's the Son of Man, Son of God, that he died for my sins and rose again from the dead, but actually to rest in him, to trust in him, to know that what he did, he did for me, and know that I'm forgiven of my sins. That kind of faith doesn't come from my reason doesn't come from my strength. I can't. I don't have any. I'm dead. But, Luther goes on, the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has called me. Just like Jesus called Lazarus from the dead, the Holy Spirit calls us today through the gospel. Through the good news, the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he did. And, and specifically what he did for you and you and you and you and me. There's no you we can point to and say Jesus didn't do this for you. We can proclaim this message and ought to. Knowing that the word of God, this gospel, this good news, is accompanied by its author whenever it's proclaimed. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit calls through the gospel. Romans 1, the gospel is God's power unto salvation to all who believe, the Jew first and also to the Greek. Uh, Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing the message of the gospel, the message concerning Christ. In uh, Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed, we see that there's soil that can't produce anything, but seed can, and it's planted in the soil. Jesus tells us what that seed is. It's the word of God. Peter and his epistle assures us that we've been born again. Now, it's an interesting analogy. Jesus uses it in John chapter 3 as he talks to Nicodemus. Born again. Why is being born used when, it, when we're talking about spiritual matters? The answer is it correlates very much to our physical birth. We need to be reminded that we didn't choose to be born. That came from outside of us, from somebody else. Not only our parents, but also we acknowledge as, as we read God's word from God himself. Born again, that's what we need. We need to be brought into spiritual life. We need to be resurrected from the dead spiritually. We can't make ourselves alive. We need to be made alive. And Peter says that we've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. What is that seed? the living and enduring word of God. We're not the cause of our coming alive. Now, a lot of us have testimonies where we talk about where we made a decision for Christ. Or where we gave our hearts to Christ. Or where we gave our lives to Christ. 
You know what? Those testimonies are very valid. I'm so grateful for people who share about when those times came, but I also want to warn people to understand what took place. It isn't that your decision saved you. That's important for us to know. You were able to make a decision because God brought you from death to life as the gospel was brought to you, as it was proclaimed to you, as it was shared with you. The Holy Spirit called you through the gospel. And so, not just at the beginning, but in the middle and all the way until the end. Each day ought to be a day. Each moment ought to be a moment when we're deciding for Christ. But we need to understand that that life that makes that decision is not that cause of our salvation. It's the result of God giving us the gift of life through his word. That's why I think it's so neat that we have a baptism today. Because faith is a gift from God, then, isn't it? That's exactly what Ephesians says. Uh, that not of yourselves. What not of ourselves? By grace, you've been saved through faith. That. Not of yourselves. It's God's gift. You didn't do anything for it. You didn't work. It's not your doing. There's no boasting, then. God did it all. God does it all. He brings us from death to life. That's good because it erases pride. That's what Paul points at in Ephesians not of works that no man can boast. There's, if you're a Christian today, you have nothing to boast about. And one of the most delightful things about true Christians who know that God did all the work and that it's all of His grace, that it all comes from His love, is they approach other people not with an air of superiority, but with an air of humility, an air of understanding that the only reason I'm saved is because of God's grace and love and mercy toward me. That's what brought me to salvation. That's what keeps me in salvation. That's Again, what Luther says in his explanation, the Holy Spirit called me through the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and preserved me in the true faith. And the true faith is faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, the one the Father sent, the one who willingly came, the one who was indwelt by the Holy Spirit and went to the cross to die for our sins, but was unable to be held by death who overcame sin and death and, and is raised from the dead, made alive as the Holy Spirit calls us through the gospel and enlightens us with his gifts. The word of God, we're told, is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It's able to do things that human beings can't do. We can't bring ourselves to life. We can't give ourselves new birth. In baptism now, will Clementine understand what's happening? No, she, she won't yet. She'll grow in that understanding as she grows up. But that's the understanding she needs to be uh, taught as she grows older. In Romans 6, we're told exactly what happens in baptism. We're connected with the death and resurrection of Christ. We're buried with baptism into Christ's death in order that he's raised from the dead. But we too might live a new life. We might have a new life to live. And, and verse 11 says... Therefore, because this is true, because God gave you new life, count yourselves now, moment by moment, day by day, dead to sin, but alive to God and Christ Jesus. Will she come to a conscious awareness, uh, awareness of that life? And the answer is, as she's taught the Word of God, yes, she will. That's a good thing. I got to watch my mom leave me twice. The first time she left wasn't death, it was Alzheimer's. She was taken from our family twice. Alzheimer's took her away. You know what is wonderful to know is that because the faith she had in Christ is God's work, even when she was unable to understand it again, when she was brought to a time in her life where intellectually she could not understand it anymore, she learned it growing up, yes. But when she was no longer able to understand, was she still saved? And the answer is yes, because faith is a gift from God. And, and what was interesting is God gave us evidence of that fact whenever we sang a hymn. She couldn't get a word out. But she sang the hymns with us. It was still there inside of her. When I read Psalm 103 to her one night, she said it word for word right with me. It was amazing. It was still there. Did she understand what she was saying anymore? But it was evidence that God gave me that God was preserving her in the faith. You see, so many times we think faith depends on our 
complete understanding. Well, we should grow in understanding. Normally, that's what should happen. We as Christians should be curious to understand our faith and study God's word so that we can understand exactly what it means. But the most important thing is we need to remember it's a gift from God that he gives and preserves through the word. The Holy Spirit working through the Word, the Holy Spirit working through the sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's Supper, feeding and nourishing that faith. So it's all of grace. It all depends on God. He gives it to the undeserving, thankfully, because I'm undeserving. And He sustains it from beginning to end. We're made alive, made alive. I don't make myself alive. I decide for Christ, yes, not the cause. The result. No room for pride. How about in the works then that I do? Remember Ephesians 10? We're God's workmanship. He's the one who's making us. And he's prepared works in advance simply for us to walk in, simply for us to do. So even when it comes to the good works we do as Christians, who gets all the praise, honor, and glory? God's word says God does. It's he who works that life in us and works that life through us. It's not my fruit that's pleasing to God. It's the fruit of the Spirit. From beginning to end, it's all of grace. And the work of the Holy Spirit is the work in my heart that I might trust in Jesus, the Savior and Lord, and, and live in the service God has restored me to do. All the glory goes to God. But that's not all. We're not meant to be loners at all. Some people claim that they're a loner Christian. They don't have to belong to any church. No, God created us to be together as his body, to encourage one another in the faith, to share the gospel with one another, to assure one another that the gospel is true, that, that our sins are forgiven and that we have eternal life to look for. A lot of times our emotions will tell us that oh, you can't possibly be, and even our intellect will come to doubt. The question then in our lives is, what are you going to believe, the word of God or your own thoughts? What are you going to believe? The Word of God or your own emotions? God has brought us into a body to encourage one another in the faith. The Holy Spirit works through the body of Christ to continue to keep us on track, to continue to nourish our faith through the proclamation of the gospel to each other. The Holy Spirit gathers. We say in the Creed, that we believe in the Holy Spirit, but then also what the Holy Spirit does. He forms the Holy Christian Church, which is the communion of saints, in which we receive and hear from each other the forgiveness of sins. God forgives you, so do I. The only ones who want to hear those words are sinners. If you're not a sinner, who cares if somebody says that you don't have anything to be forgiven? The Holy Spirit makes us aware of our sin and makes us long to be forgiven by God and be forgiven by, by others and to find that forgiveness in Christ. And as our fellow believers find that forgiveness in Christ, find their willingness to also love us and forgive us and be patient with us and to watch us grow as God allows growth. The Holy Spirit gathers us. He preserves us in union with Jesus Christ in the one true faith as he enlightens and sanctifies and gathers the whole Christian church on earth. The Holy Spirit preserves it in union with Jesus Christ as the church. In union with Jesus Christ and the one true faith. And in that church, we get to hear the good words, the good news. Your sins are forgiven. You're cleansed. But we don't see it all yet. We're told, boy, look at our call to worship. Same thing. It talks about where our life is hidden right now. It's in Christ. And the same thing is true right now as, as Ephesians 2 tells us that one day God will reveal the fact that we belong to Christ. Luther's explanation goes right along with Scripture. It says at the last day, all these things that are hidden, it won't be any longer. When Jesus returns, we'll be raised up too. Will be raised up along with all the dead and everlasting life. Life with God in His presence will be what we experience day by day. I don't know if there's days in heaven throughout eternity. Let's just put it that way. No more night, no more darkness. The sun won't illumine, and illumine things anymore, but the Son of God will. S O N, not S U N, any longer. 
Grant everlasting life to me and to all who believe in Christ. We live in a world that speaks a word that's completely contrary to this word of God, that would have us look to ourselves for all of our hope, that tells us, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, to your own self be true. All of it lies. All of it that promises life leads to nothing but death. And we're attracted by it because of our identity. But God has a different calling for us. Is a different message for us. The one who created us also has come, continuing to love us, to redeem us in Christ, and then to give us the gift of faith through the proclamation of the good news of who Jesus is and what he did. So today I want to tell you Jesus died for you. And he rose again from the dead for you. It happened in history. It's God's work. And through the proclamation of that truth, his desire is that you would come to repentance. If somebody's lost, after hearing the gospel, the fault lies completely on them. The power is always present. And the sower and the seed, Jesus talks about seed that never grows, and the fault is always in the soil. But if it does grow and bear fruit, the credit never goes to the soil. It always goes to the seed. The Holy Spirit calls us through the gospel today. The power of salvation has been proclaimed. So today, if you're trusting in Jesus as Savior and Lord, or even if through hearing this word, you come to trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord, God did it. He did all the work. He brought you from death to life. And it's real life. And if you want that life nourished, don't look inside to have it nourished. Continue to look to the source that gave that life in the first place. That source is the Holy Spirit as he continues to call you through the word. As he continues to give you the gifts of God as the, the word connected with the Lord's Supper comes to you. The body and blood of Jesus given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins to assure you that what Jesus did, he did for you today. is a day of salvation. We live in the time between Christ's first and second coming. And he calls all sinners then to turn away from that deadness. I can't. You're right, you can't. But the gospel's been proclaimed. He can do it. And does do it in our lives. May today, as, as we witness this baptism, have all our pride erased when it comes to our salvation and relationship with God. Because we've done no more than Clementine will have done to be saved. And I assure you, she's saved. How can I assure you? God's word says so. But we're saved in the same way, all by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It's God's gift. The Holy Spirit calls us through the gospel and preserves us in that faith. Amen. We'll sing of the formation of the church and the foundation on which it stands together now. Uh, number 292, the church is one foundation.
persecution and to be those who are trusting in Jesus, not ourselves, knowing that we're sinners. We have opportunity to confess our sins to God and know His forgiveness in Christ. Let's confess our sins together. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you to confess that we have sinned against you in our words, actions, and our thoughts. We come to ask your forgiveness and to seek your great mercy. We come to you with the merits of Jesus Christ. Amen. Look not on our sins or our iniquity. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ so that we may be clean before you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thou hast promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and pardon free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to cleansed of all your unrighteousness. Serve the Lord then out of the salvation he has provided and will continue to provide for you with a glad heart, rejoicing in what he has done and is doing and will do. Amen. And call on Amy and Juliana to come forward at this time with uh, all those who are taking part now in Clementine's back.
until she shall come unto you in your heavenly kingdom. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the renunciation and the faith into which we baptize our children, we confess at this time. We renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways. And together may we confess the faith into which we baptize our children using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into heaven. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Damien and Juliana, then do you desire now that Clementine be baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? If so, answer, we do. And then do you promise, following her baptism, to instruct her in the Word of God and to nurture her in the chastening and admonition of the Lord? If so, answer, we do. The Lord keep her going out from this day forth and forevermore, Clementine. Receive the sign of the cross on your brow and on your breast as a token that you will be a believer in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. An amazing thing. We see water on the head. God's Word says that Jesus' death has become hers, that she's been buried with Jesus through baptism into his death. In order that as Christ is raised from the dead, she too can live a new life. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, now who has made you his child in holy baptism and has received you into his believing church, strengthen you with his grace in the life everlasting. Amen. So Jessica, as a sponsor now of Clementine, you're to witness that she's been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Remember her then before God in your prayers and make certain as far as possible that she's reared in the faith and the fear of God so that she may grow up in Christ. And as she grows up, that she may remain in Him even now that she's been baptized and grafted into Christ. We believe because of what God's Word teaches, that God gives the gift of faith in baptism, but this gift can be lost unless a child is taught the Word of God, upheld by prayer, and given a Christian example to follow. Damien and Juliana, this is first year responsibility and privilege to, to raise her to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Also then, yours, Jessica, and finally the responsibility and privilege of the entire church that the Holy Spirit has gathered our privilege as well. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful little gift. We thank you for Clementine and that you knit her together in her mother's womb and then brought her forth so that we could meet her and watch her grow. Thank you, Lord, too, now that you've given her the gift of new birth, the gift through your Holy Spirit, faith in Jesus. We commit her to you and know that the good work you've begun in her, you'll be able to complete until the day of Christ Jesus. We pray that you work in us, that we might be faithful in nurturing that gift through proclaiming and teaching your word. And as she grows older and comes to an understanding, receiving the body and blood of Jesus in holy communion. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that when it comes to our salvation, we can look outside of ourselves who are so weak and look to you who is almighty and all-knowing and know that you'll be faithful in your promises. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. This too, and it's my turn. I get to take you now, Clementine. I got to meet her when she was just three, four hours old or something like that. I, I got notified quite early. I was already up in the hospital. 
So I got to meet this little woman. Wow, she's growing up so fast, I can hardly believe it. This is our sister in Christ. She's been made part of the family of God, as, as God by grace has given her the gift of faith. So this is your new sister, Clementine. Uh, God has given us the privilege of watching her grow, but not only watching, but the privilege of sharing with her, you Sunday school teachers and everyone else too, making sure that she knows that she's welcome in God's family, that she's loved, that she's cared for, that she's nourished with the food that God provides, His Word, and, and that again, as she grows up and can understand the Lord's Supper. So, not only your granddaughter, but your sister in Christ. Isn't that neat? That wonderful? Clementine, our little sweetheart. I didn't break her. So. There you go. Blessings. Yeah, thank you. Blessings. And you may return that to us. I'll call on the ushers to come and receive them. Thank you for entrusting to a spiritual treasure, Lord, in Christ. I thank you also for what you give us to live on this earth. We long to bring a portion of it back to you now, not to buy anything from you, but simply to honor you and to bring worship to you and pray that you use these gifts that others too may hear the good news of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit would call them through the gospel and bring them to faith that when we come to experience eternal life in heaven with you, we might rejoice with men who have been called as we've sent out your word. Grant this, we pray in Jesus' name.
Lord, I pray you will show each one here that Jesus died for them and that they can trust and rest in him each and every moment. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to proclaim that word throughout not only our city, but throughout the world. Lord, we pray for those who are going through special difficult times. We continue to lift Patty up to you and ask Heavenly Father that as she's receiving medical help that that you would use that to heal her and leave her with us for many more years. Lord, I want to pray today especially too for Caleb and for his parents and for all those who know and love that little boy. I pray that if it be your will, you'd heal him as well and that you would show yourself glorious and all-powerful and, and all-wise. Lord, I pray especially for all those who know and love him that we would be able to see time and light of eternity, that we'd not be overcome by despair, that we'd never be overcome thinking that evil wins, but that we would know that you are the giver of life and that even when we despair inside ourselves, you continue to give that life. Father, you know all of the other needs that are present, both written in our bulletin and, and also on our hearts and minds. We just ask, Heavenly Father, that your grace would be visible in all situations, that those who are living at ease would rejoice with thanksgiving for all of the gifts you give. Those that are going through hard times might know that you are a loving Heavenly Father who goes through all of our needs with us provides for us complete healing of eternal life for each and every one who trusts in you. Hear us then, Lord, as we bring all our needs to you through the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll uh, stand as we close with Honor and We Rejoice in 248. <clears throat>